you're live. Hi, this is Mike Hi. Zipser from Fast Forward here for another Faster Forward Zoom Live to YouTube thingy. And with me this time is Matthew Kressel, amazing writer, and Ellen Datlow, editor extraordinaire. And we're going to talk to them about what they're doing and about the KGB fantastic fiction readings that they both host in New York. Uh, welcome to Faster Forward. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Yeah. So um, how are you guys doing? What's happening in New York with the <laughs> pandemic? New York's okay. I, I, I go out every day to go to the supermarket or the post office or my mailbox and um, everyone's masked in my neighborhood. I mean, I hear yeah. from people there's a few blocks down and she said they're not. And it's like, really? <laughs> yeah, I'm in Queens. Everybody's, everyone's wearing masks. It's, you see maybe one out of a hundred people that aren't wearing it. And if they, if they aren't wearing it, it's either if they're in a car driving somewhere and like, if I'm in my car, I'll take my mask off. Or like maybe well, they're, they're far away from other people. They're not near people. Right. Yeah, but indoors, everybody's wearing masks. Yeah. So um, has it been affecting your work? I mean, a writer and an editor, I wouldn't imagine it's making too much of it. But you've got a day job, Matthew. Um, yeah, you know, I, I do IT work, but uh, I have a home office. So like my schedule didn't change a whole lot. Uh, the difference was that my wife, who uh, is an occupational therapist, was now working from home doing uh, therapy with children. So she used the big desktop computer till about three o'clock. So the only thing that really shifted was that I basically stayed on the laptop longer. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's been an adjustment for sure. To, and for you know, me, to... nothing much has changed. You know, I work from home anyway. Yeah. Except for traveling to conventions, which I miss. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. See, seeing everybody hanging in the bar. Yeah. We all miss that. Um, so, and right now you're doing, you're acquiring things for tour.com, correct? Ellen? Yeah, short stories and novellas. And um, I'm working on some anthologies. I have. Always. Uh, yeah, always. <laughs> um, I have a couple of readers from my, uh, from my best horror of the year. And um, usually one comes over to my apartment and picks up stuff, but she can't. So I'm, I actually mailed her a carton of things to read, and I have another carton for her to read also. But other than that, it's not all that different. So they're sending them actually hard copy? I'm getting hard copies. And I said, if I, things that are hard copies that I have my reader read, she'll read, I'll send to her, mail to her. I have another reader in California who's reading, a friend who's reading, um, electronic things for me that I don't read that you know uh, like light speed and because it's science fiction mostly she looks at it for me and other um, online things she'll read she can read that, that's no different because I was mailing emailing them they're forwarding them to her anyway and so yeah I, I'm fascinated by what you do because and you've been doing it for what 35 years now 40. 40. Editing in general, editing short fiction in general since 1980. Wow. <laughs> I know. It just seemed like yesterday. Yeah. 1990 just seemed like <laughs> yesterday. It's like, really? It's like, oh, come on. <laughs> I've been so have you edited Matthew? Before. Sorry? Have yes, you edited? I, I have. I have bought stories by him for my anthologies. And um, didn't I, I bought something for tour.com, too. Yeah. For tour, yeah. 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 So I've published him. I've edited him. So, so tell me in confidence, what's he like to work with? Easy. Very easy, but you better ask him what I'm like to work with. Yeah, what, what's she like, Matthew? Oh, she's a terror. No, I'm just kidding. Ellen, <laughs> Ellen's super easy to work with, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, when I've worked with someone a lot, I'm much more less holding their hands while I edit them. I'll just, you know, uh, rather than say, I, I assume that the people who I edit a lot will understand when I say this, blah, 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 whether uh, that I suggesting not demanding unless it's something i really really disagree with that i really think you need to change that but um people who i work with who are newer i try to be a lot more um i don't know what uh tactful i guess i feel i can be direct with the people i work with a lot because yeah. i understand that i'm doing it with them not to them <laughs> right. 
And I would think, you know, people would realize that you know what you're doing. Not always. No? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've made editing mistakes. You know, I've, I've um, kind of misinterpreted things or, you know, I, I'm, no one's perfect. You know, no one's a perfect reader, you know. Uh, but I expect if a writer who I'm working with disagrees with something that I suggest or that I think is going on, um, I expect to talk to them about it and communicate. I mean, that's the whole point of being an editor is to communicate with the author and get the best work out of them you can. Yeah, yeah. And Matthew, you've done some publishing yourself, right? Uh, Census 5 Press. And... Yeah, yeah. So um, I basically had uh, two ventures. One of them was a magazine called Sybil's Garage. And, you know, I called it a magazine, but it was basically an anthology. It came out once a year um, for about seven years. And uh, was we what's what, that? What, what was it named after? Who is Sybil? And where'd you get the oh, name? Yeah, it's an interesting story there. So, um, you well it's named it. so uh, my friend, uh, Devin Poor, he's a writer. We, uh, we were taking a, a class together at the new school and uh, we were trying to come up with, we were coming home on the, you know, we both lived in Hoboken at the time. We were walking home from the train and uh, I was like, you know, I want to come up with a name for this magazine and I, and I want it to be related to maybe Hoboken. How about Sybil's Cave? And then he says to me, oh, they probably turned it into a garage by now. <laughs> so uh, Sybil's Cave, um, Basically, there was a natural spring on the on the north side of Hoboken, kind of in the almost in Weehawken, basically. And um, they used to charge people in the 1800s like five cents to have a, a bottle of water from the spring. And it was supposed to have medicinal properties. And at the time, five cents was ridiculous for water. Uh, turns out when they tested it years later, it was full of lead and all these heavy metals. It was terrible for you. <laughs> but uh, it was um, it's a famous cave. And then there was also a. Um, uh, a, a murder that happened in Hoboken where, where uh, a young woman's body was found near the cave and it inspired um, uh, Poe uh, for his stories like uh, the, the Rue Morgue uh, and uh, the other one with that detective, if someone helped me out. Uh, but yeah, so it's, it's, there's a literary history to the cave as well. Is that the gold uh, bug? So, what's that? Is it the gold bug? I don't think it's the gold bug. I, I have to look it up. It's been yeah, a while. Yeah, it's the, it's the one with the same detective at the uh, murders on Rue Morgue. Monsieur Dupin? Yeah. Yes, yes. And um, yeah, so so it was, uh, we called it Sybil's Garage, which um, is kind of a fun name. And, you know, it, uh, the, I, I like suggestive names. I like names that you, people are like, oh, I wonder what that means. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, every, every cover, every issue really was, you know, uh, I tried to make it a work of art. It was a very physical thing. Uh, I wish I had some copies nearby, but um, they, uh, you know, we did a lot. We spent a lot, I spent a lot of time on the covers, like each cover is unique. And then uh, inside the magazine, each story had, you know, illustrations. And then in some of the later ones, I actually had uh, hidden stories in the marginalia. So in, mm -hmm. in um, issue six and seven, there was a story of a time traveler who was leaving their lover notes through the through the magazine, um, and then uh, the other thing that we published it was the one actual anthology we did was uh, Paper Cities, edit, edited by Katerina Sedia, um, and that actually contains um, Catherine Valente's uh, Palimpsest story, the one that inspired the novel, uh, and that that anthology went to win, win the World Fantasy Award, so. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that was like the only anthology we ever published, won the World Fantasy Award. I said, oh, I'm going to quit while I'm ahead. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, Ellen didn't it. quit while she was ahead. <laughs> yeah. Well, it took me a long time to win any awards, though. Yeah, but now you've won pretty much all of them. Doesn't mean I want don't want more. <laughs> yeah. And Life Achievement Awards and contributions. You've got like, you, you just keep winning you have so many ellen you don't know where to put them well i am running out of space i have to say oh i say there's room for one more on my armoire i've got them all on my, <laughs> post them on my armoire. now how did you get into a career of editing particularly short fiction the way you do 
Is that something uh, you study for? Do you say no, that's what I want to do? No. Well, yes and no. I mean, there's no way to, you can't teach editing for one thing. Um, I mean, I was a reader. I wanted to do something reading when I was, when I, it, well, first I wanted to be a veterinarian until I realized I'd have to deal with dying, dead, dying animals, sick and dying animals, and be good at math, which you forget it, you know? <laughs> so then I thought, well, I love reading, so maybe I'll work, I'll either work in a bookstore, become a librarian, and go into publishing. I never, I did work in a library at SUNY in Albany, and it's like, no, I don't want to do that. Um, bookstore is like, not really very, it's hard to make a living working in a bookstore. I realized that. And so I thought I'd try to get into publishing. So um, I actually started, I was in mainstream book publishing for several years. And uh, the first magazine job I had was at Omni, actually. And I started there around 79 to 80. I mean, the magazine began October 78. But I always read short fiction. I mean, I always, I mean, I read novels a lot, but I read, uh oh, like, I'm sorry, Jack did not go for my plans. But okay, <laughs> and he's also, I, and he's also my, my cat's my behind the laptop right now. And he's also ringing the chimes. <laughs> <laughs> he's lying down now, so I think he's happy enough after he knocked over the plant. Um, I always loved short stories. I read, you know, Bullfinch's mythology, Guy de Maupassant's stories, Nathaniel Hawthorne. Um, later on, I read science fiction, fantasy, and horror short stories. So, I mean, it was always something I was interested in. Um, I fell into editing. I didn't know what it meant. I mean, I don't really remember the move from, I want to get into publishing, do I want to edit? And what does editing mean anyway? I didn't really know. I mean, I knew it had to do with reading a lot. Um, so it was kind of, and it's, a, it's something you learn on the job. You really cannot teach editing. Copy editing is not the same thing as line editing and substantive editing. You can teach copy editing um, and proofreading. But Ben Bove is one who gave me a chance with, uh, with short fiction. I mean, I had done some editing when I was in book publishing, but with the short fiction, he actually, he sat me down once when I, before I actually officially worked for Omni, he sat me down, had me look at a story. I do not remember the story. I don't remember who was by, was by someone well known or not, and said, line edit the first two pages. And I did whatever I did. And he went over the pages with me and said, why did you do that? Why did you do that? Why did you do that? And that is the extent of being taught how to be an editor. <laughs> you learn it on the job. It really is something you just either have the skill or you don't. You can't, and you develop as with any kind of profession or any kind of skill you learn I still learn things when I'm working with people um, it's not something you can teach though hmm. so let's jump into something a little different because the, one of the reasons I wanted to get both of you on is because of the fantastic fiction at KGB the readings that you guys have been hosting for a while now I think and the KGB is a bar I saw where it was listed as one of New York City's top 10 dive bars. Mm -hmm. And that's a huge compliment. Yeah. And yeah. it's also a literary hotspot and mm -hmm. has been for a while. So why don't you tell people about what this is? You can take that, Matt. You're better at it than I am. Um, well, <laughs> the series itself is just a, is a monthly speculative fiction reading series. So we, we have two guests. Uh, every month, we usually try to pair uh, one well-known author w with one lesser known, but you know, it depends on how the people's schedules and, and whatnot. And um, so, as you said, it was held at the, uh, before the pandemic, before the quarantine, we, we had the series at the KGB bar, which is a uh, Soviet themed um, uh, dive bar. And in the best sense of the word, in, in uh, uh, the village of Manhattan, <laughs> Uh, you totally got to walk up these really, <laughs> these really narrow stairs. You know, the old New York City buildings where the stairs are kind of like crooked from that, the building settling and you go up and then there's this tiny little door and you turn around and you're in this bar and there's like, you know, statues of Lenin and posters of, like, you know, the Soviet leaders and, and uh, a big hammer and sickle flag. And, and um, you know, it's, it's uh, it, it used to be, it, yeah, it's Russian stuff. It Polish used to be, what'd you say? And Polish vodka. Sorry. And Polish vodka. Yeah. So it, it used to be uh, a speakeasy for uh, Ukrainian socialists. Um, 
uh, they would come there and it basically like, you know, a modern day democratic club, I guess you would call it. And, uh, and, uh, now it's it's become one of the best um, literary venues in the city. So almost every night of the week, there's some reading, uh, whether it's, you know, I think ours is the only speculative fiction one, but there's poetry, there's literary fiction. Um, you and know, I think they, they, nonfiction sometimes. Nonfiction, yeah, they do. They have, yeah, and they, I they saw have, there was journalism. They have journalism yeah, there's readings. Yeah. Yeah, and and there's occasional one-offs of other um, speculative fiction group sometimes want a one-off, but not a regular series. Yeah, so it's it's a great place uh, to to host um, a series, and uh, the series itself started. Um, Ellen and I are not one hundred percent sure uh, when it started, but we think either the late nineties or early aughts. Uh, it was started by um, Terry Bisson and Alice Turner. Yeah, and um, Terry moved to California. And then um, Alice left Playboy. Alice, it, it initially, was thought to, I mean, Alice was trying to get literary writers or mainstream writers to read with um, spec fic writers to show how it was not that much of a difference. And that's how it started. They started that way. But when Alice left Playboy, she decided not to do it anymore. Yeah. And then I mean, it's, it's, we, it's pretty much all spec fic now, although we do have the occasional author come in who, who might be known like in more literary circles, but they wrote something speculative. And um, yeah, so so Ellen's been doing it since like the mid aughts. What did we say, 2003 or four? I and then I, I came in like 2008. Um, and in between, and, Gavin, I mean, Gavin Grant was doing it for several years and when he and Kelly were living, Kelly Link were living in Brooklyn, but they moved to Massachusetts. Initially, he actually, they commuted. They actually did it, came in, but it became yeah. too much. It's a three hour drive for them. It was too much. That's and nice, and yeah. then uh, I remember the day that uh, I think it was either Gavin or Ellen emailed me and said, oh, would you like to host? And my initial reaction was, no, I want to sit in the back, drink my <laughs> Russian beer and listen to great fiction. And I, I like emailed my, my group and was like, what do you guys think? And, and my friend, me, or I, I called my friend Mercurio Rivera, David Rivera, and he was like, He's a lawyer. He was literally in the courtroom. He calls me up. He's like, whatever you're doing, don't respond to that email. You need to do this. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so I didn't respond. And then um, I thought about it and they were like, oh no, it's, it's, you, you know, you're going to meet all these great people and, and uh, you know, the responsibility is not going to be that much. And, and I, it was, it, it's been great. I mean, it's, it's one of the, I'm, I'm really glad I didn't say no. It's, it's, it was, um, it's it's just been really wonderful like getting to see all the and meet all these writers from all over the world and and yeah. hear like you know hear hear the fiction and and you know um ellen and i have become really good friends and and yeah it's it's and just, it's really uh, nice to do it with somebody i mean if i if one of us did it it's a lot more stressful i mean i remember once i don't know if you were there or it was gavin that i had a leak in my bathroom suddenly my ceiling was like flooding and I had, I couldn't go. And luckily, whoever, was that when you would take, had been there? I don't remember. I don't but, remember. But maybe going. you were, because I, I had a, at the last minute, I couldn't go. And yeah. if, you know, if it was just me, I don't know what would have happened. So it's always yeah. good. That, and, you know, usually once or twice a year, one of us is going away a particular month. Yeah. For something that we have to do. So it's, and also it just takes the full burden off one person to do it totally themselves. Yeah. And that's really nice. Yeah. Now, what and kind of crowds do you taste. get? Sorry. What kind of crowds do you get when it was at the bar? Totally, you mean numbers? Yeah, how or? many, what kind of people? It totally it? varies. Well, the number totally varies. It can be very, very small group, and it can be a huge group that's people waiting, trying to quit, can't get in and leave because they can't get in. And there's really not that much, it's not all that predictable. You know, sometimes there's something else going on that night that we didn't know about, but we're always the third Wednesday of the month, no matter what. And so sometimes we have, we have, we usually have a core of regulars and um, a small core, maybe five or six people who always come. And then there are people who come because they want to hear a particular reader or they're friends with the reader or they're somehow they're, you know, they're students or teachers of the reader. So it's a, it can be very varied. I mean, you can tell from our photographs. I mean, I, I'm not, able to photograph virtually but every month when I'm there I would take pictures and you can get a feel for who attends 
from looking at the batch of the photographs for each month. Yeah, and I always tell like if, if someone's new to the city and they're a writer or they're just interested in spec fiction, I always say, you know, come to the series because it's a great way to to meet other people with similar interests. You know, there's writers, agents, yeah. editors, fans, yeah. everybody shows up there. Yeah, I mean, I first met some people who I later published at KGB not realizing they were writers. At yeah. least a few people who were like, oh, yeah. I didn't know they wrote. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. It's really become a, it's, it's a thing. I mean, I know that when we've gone up on our trips to New York, it just never was on the, that Wednesday, because we always said, well, we got to check and see when is, when is the KGB readings? Because right. we always wanted to go. Well, um, I was it. saying this before we went live, but I'll just repeat it uh, for, for the viewers, is that, um, we have been doing um, the live stream of the show for the last uh, several months since the quarantine began. So you can watch it on YouTube. Since and then before that, we had a pod, we have a podcast. So we going back about five years. So almost every single reading is, is online and you could listen to it um, just the audio, but um, you can get a feel for what it's like when you hear the crowds, you hear sirens going by you know sometimes there's a performance upstairs that they forget that we have a reading and they do like live music and we're like wait wait, wait yeah. till we're done <laughs> yeah and i wanted to talk about the changes you did with it with the pandemic and the lockdown and quarantine and stuff is that you guys went went virtual with it and it's on you know you can get to it live on youtube yeah. and in fact i watched the one last night and the one before that, yeah, well, and it's great. So the interesting thing is I realized a little late because we already scheduled a bunch of people that because of the way it is virtual, we can get anyone from around the world yeah. to read. Um, but unfortunately, unfortunately, we've already scheduled certain people, so we didn't want to knock them out and say, oh, well, we, you know, we want someone from across the country or in another, wor another city. Uh, country here blah 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 the, you know we so we didn't do that but now we're starting to do that you know we've managed um we're getting some people from far away and, and we're getting uh well gibson's gonna read i forget in november or december i forget and cool. joe hill and um priya sharma is gonna read november in, yeah in november it's it's okay. great because we've done that with this thing where one of the early ones we did with was with a couple artists and there was one from the netherlands and one from california and we just found a time that worked and and it's yeah. great you get people from anywhere yeah. yeah well for us the time is the time <laughs> yeah it has to be you know it's like poor priya it's gonna she's a doctor and she's doctoring you know she's full-time doctor and she's She's going to go first in her month because it's like five hours later in England. So she'll be going to bed at like 1 a.m. or something. Yeah. Yeah. Well, last night, Ben Rosenbaum, what was it, 3 a.m. for him when he, when he went? 2 a.m. Yeah. He's, right. well, yeah. no, he's in uh, Basel, Switzerland. I mean, he was supposed to be coming to New York, though. You know, so normally in the non virtual world, he would, in, without the pandemic, he would have come to New York live reading. That was the whole intention. Yeah. But it was nice to be able to accommodate it anyway that he could do it. What are you looking yeah. at? Oh, <laughs> that was <laughs> no. weird. That Sorry, was so weird. my wife is leaving and she just wanted to. This give woman me just suddenly appeared. I know. Yes. Gave yes. her a kiss and vanished. That's, it's the TARDIS. She's popping in from another. Matt, how did you get your background? Is that a normal? Uh, you just go into Zoom. I one of the settings on the Zoom. Is that a, set, a one that you can use or your own? Uh, I download. I don't remember where I downloaded it from. But, um, that Doctor Who. Theater? Would it work? Would it make things lighter? I think it's lighter? a Doctor Who thing. Oh no, it is a Doctor Who, but I, yeah. I don't know. I don't know where I got it from. I remember they've done it, a bunch. Yeah, it, at the beginning. You of need this a powerful device. enough computer. I can't do it on mine. I oh, have okay. done it. I've done photographs of my stuff, but I'm not sure that they would work that well. Yeah, no, no, it's the TARDIS. <laughs> uh, well, let me ask though: if I used something bright like that, would that make everything brighter, or is that just? Uh, it wouldn't affect no. your face, no. Because oh, it's no. not. It was, a, it was a good idea. That's too bad. It's not physically there. <laughs> I know it's not, but I thought maybe somehow the reflection. I don't know. <laughs> too bad. So, so that is exciting, and it's a great thing, and we'll have links for it and stuff down below. Oh, or 
wherever it is, uh, wherever this yeah. is on the screen afterwards, so people can find the fantastic fiction. It's great. I, I went online for a couple. It's a lot of fun. And you can ask questions, sort of, from the chat from it. Right. Yeah. Yeah, no, and, we definitely uh, can. Yeah, that's a great thing. Like, we never really did a Q&A on the live readings. Um, I know that... Um, I mean, I mean, uh, in-person readings. Yeah, no, I know that um, the, the one in, that Charlie Jane Andrews runs in San Francisco does. They, they don't do Q&A. They do... Didn't they do... Or, is that the same one Terry... Bisson did or does anyway they do interviews with the readers um I don't want to do that it's a lot of too much work actually frankly but I think that maybe if we go if we ever go in person again maybe we do a Q&A you know we could do Q&A's in you know live yeah, yeah I think I think um you know keeping it short maybe because we we're all like everyone at that point everyone's hungry because we uh, when we do the in person, we go out to dinner <laughs> yeah. afterwards. So we want to keep it fairly short. Um, sometimes the readings go a little uh, long. We have, yeah, we have to get out. We need to stop the readings by 9 p.m. Although we've actually, the last year or so, they start, they were much faster for some reason. It didn't, we got out by, we were done by 8.30. Yeah, I mean, I think people have been better about not going over their time. I mean, if they read 20, 25 minutes, uh, I see you later. If you they read 20 to 25 minutes, um, you know, and then a 15 minute break, that's, you know, just yeah. a little over an hour or so. Now, do the virtual ones have the same time limits or can they go yeah. longer? Um, no, I mean, it doesn't have to, but. We well, we tell the authors that we, they should read 20 to 25 minutes. Yeah, I mean, the thing about reading is you don't want it longer than that if people the attention span of someone listening to a reader, you do not want it more than 25 minutes. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so it has nothing to do with how much time. Well, it does. I mean, if you go way over you, in lot and when we do it live, you screw up the whole schedule, <clears throat> but it's more um, the attention span of the audience for certainly for the virtual readings. Yeah. And that's but the same reason why we, why we do um, like the live version, we're at a bar. So in between readings, we'll, we'll, sometimes wait 15, 20 minutes for the next reader. But in, you know, on YouTube, we're not going to do that. So we do, right. we do like a five minute break. Yeah. yeah I mean, at, in person, we wait, we want people to hopefully order from the bar and drink because that's how they make their money. We don't pay any fee to, to read there. Yeah. 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 Well, it's been doing great. I mean, the, the readings online, I think are doing pretty well. So yeah, I like mean, I said, we we'll have links. We're trying to figure out if we can somehow do it when we get back in person. Similar. Yeah. I mean, one thing that I was thinking of is um, like I have my old um, cell phone because I bought a new one last year and uh, I could just set it up on a tripod and just live stream it to YouTube. It, you know, it won't be as fancy as we have it now with the titles and overlays and, you know, the foreheads in the, in the window. But You do uh, a nice job with that, by the way. I mean, that's mostly the tool we use. That's uh, we use something called StreamYard. And sorry, my neighbor's kid is screaming. I'm gonna close the window. Right. Oh, um, <laughs> we use this tool called StreamYard. So we were using the um, like the, the free version, and then we we finally paid for the subscription because we've been using it for so long. And it offers like a lot of um, you know cool little overlays and backgrounds and things like that. makes it makes it look more professional. Yeah, looks good. Looks good. Um, well, let's move away from the bar, <laughs> so to speak. Um, Matthew, I just read uh, King of Shards. Oh. Which is, is that your first novel? <clears throat> that is my first novel, yeah. And what was is great, by the way, I loved having the, the, the Jewish kind of mythos woven into that kind of a book. I don't see that very often. And yeah, it, and it was, I enjoyed that. Yeah, it was uh, it was it was an interesting adventure uh, uh, publishing that um, for sure. You know, um, it's uh, people have been asking me about the second book for a while. I'm actually releasing it uh, on my Patreon, uh, huh. two chapters a month. Uh, so, and we'll have yeah. a link to his Patreon down below or yeah. there, or wherever it is. And and like early access to other other fiction things that I'm working on, a novel and shorts. Um, I have a, um, 
a short story coming out in Lightspeed, and it's a pseudo sequel. When I say a pseudo sequel, it's not actually a sequel. It's just it just takes place in the same world. Um, and so the I a story that I published ten years ago in Inner Zone, um, I'm, I released as an ebook. Just if, so when people the new story is called um, Still You Linger Like Soot in the Air, which will be in Lightspeed in August, um, and the the first story is called Saving Diego, which I'll, I, I did release on my Patreon already. And uh, probably when the story comes out, I'll, I'll uh, put it up online as an ebook for, for everybody. But uh, yeah. What was it like for you moving from short fiction to working on a novel? Uh, well, you know, I'm, I think I'm always kind of working on both. I actually just finished um, another novel. It's a, a young adult um, science fiction uh, story. Um, but I'm all, always working on shorts. I, I think what I do is like, I, I've discovered that I always need a project to be working on. So um, if I finish a novel, then I go and I do a couple shorts for a while, then I go back to a novel. I mean, novels are definitely like bigger beasts. Uh, they take a lot of uh, sustained thought and concentration and, you know, a short, uh, you know, I'm a pretty fast writer of short stories. I can finish a short story in like a week or two. Uh, novels, that's more like a year for me, um, just because I, I write, rewrite and rewrite again. And, um, you know, and it, it just takes me a long time. But, um, you know, I, I think with novels, it's you have a lot of balls to keep in the air. And it, it's like your so-called working memory. I think it, it taxes your working memory more and it, it's, it helps to be like immersed in it, to work on it every day. So it's always fresh in your mind. And, um, you know, I just, I just finished the book like last week and then reread it through, um, I finished the book two weeks ago and reread it through last week. And just, just to go from start to finish, to just have it all in my brain at the same time. And I actually said, oh, you know, I did there's a couple small things, not much, but I did, you know, forget a few things that I needed to, to fix. So, um, yeah, it's, it's certainly, um, you know, uh, a larger task and, and in, in some ways more difficult, but um, it's, it's, it's really satisfying when you finish a book for sure. Are you ever going to do anything with the um, the baseball sto the story that you did for after? The great game at the end of the world. Yeah, that was wonderful. Yeah, yeah you know, um, thank you. Um, you did a BA story for Terry and me that was terrific. More more than one person has said, "Oh, you're going to turn that into a novel," including my wife. I haven't actually. Um, or even I've, more stories, if not. Yeah, not yeah, more stories in that in that world. I mean. It's something that uh, that I definitely want to revisit. Um, right now, I'm I'm slowly, well, I'm also working on a a novella, like a far future novella. Um, it's it's basically uh, a young woman is a, is abandoned abandoned on a, a space station when her father gets arrested, and then when he um, vanishes from the station prison, it's she goes on a search basically across the galaxy to find where he is. But that that universe is is the same universe as the two stories that I just mentioned, and peripherally to some other stories. So like what I'm kind of working on now is building that universe up because it's I'm excited about it. You know, when you're excited about something, you just have to do it. Great, great. Now we've talked to Helen some about how she started and all that. Did you were you always wanting to be a writer? I mean, how did you get started? Um, well, no, I didn't want, I, I, I think, um, like a lot of writers, I always lived in my imagination and I didn't realize until I was much older that I was basically writing novels in my head. And, you know, um, you know, I, I was like the kid who was like on an airplane at 12 and I'm like, I'm not on an airplane, I'm on a spaceship and I'm going to another planet. And like, you know, we would go visit my grandfather and like in my head, I'm like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm on another world. I mean. Uh, you know, I, I was always heavily in my imagination and then it, it wasn't really until, um, I was, I was older. I think I was in my late twenties and, um, 
a, a friend suggested I, I take, because I was talking about, you know, writing something more seriously, and a friend suggested I take a class at the, at the new school. And it just so happened to be uh, Terry Bisson's class. So, uh, but Terry just left that year to move to California and it was uh, uh, Alice Turner of Playboy t uh, took over for him. So she was the teacher. She was great. Um, and that's where I met, um, well, basically at the, when the class ended, a few of us wanted to start a, a writer's group of our own. And then Alice emailed uh, several of us, including um, Devin Poor, who I mentioned before, and said, oh, you know, there's this other group that is looking for people. And these, uh, this other group is, I'm still in that group now. Uh, at the time, they were called Zocalo, but we renamed it to uh, Altered Fluid, which is uh, named after an Edna St. Vincent Millay poem. Um, but um, that group has had a lot of members. Uh, a lot of people, have, you know, New York is a, is a transient city. People come, they stay every few years, they leave. So we've had a lot of members in the group. Now we have like 10 core members. Um, N.K. Jemison is a member, uh, Sam Miller, uh, Kaya Shante Wilson, um, Alyssa Wong is an alum alumnus. Uh, she uh, was part of the group, Elia Don Johnson, uh, Mercuria Rivera. So um, yeah, I guess, I guess I just got, I, you know, once I got hooked up with the, the writers group, I, I really never, never looked back. Um, you know, we, we were still meeting with the pandemic, actually. We, we, we still meet, you know, online, like, you know, a couple times a month and share stories and critique each other's work. And it's, it's nice to, to have that uh, support circle. Yeah, it sounds like it. Um, now, Ellen, um, do you think you'll be doing more stuff with Terry Windling? I'm always jealous when somebody gets to work with Terry Windling. I don't know. I mean, I, I would like to, but I don't think she has the stamina or the, yeah. you know, it's more that than anything else. She's working on her own stuff. Yeah. I mean, we were, I was hoping eventually we would do another uh, retold fairy, adult fairy tale anthology, but I don't Those think Those are amazing. Yeah, the fairy tale stuff the two of you do is mind yeah, blowing. We, it was fun. And, uh, you know, the mythic series, you know, we've enjoyed working together in, in Victoria. And I would, and she would, but I don't think she can do it. I just don't think she has the energy you know, to do that and what other things she's doing. So which anthologies are you working on right now that you can tell us about? Well, <laughs> I'm, finished, I'm trying to do, I have one that's handed in to Tachyon um, that's a reprint anthology of body horror called Body Shocks. And I'm struggling with the intro to that. That's everything's done, but the intro. And I'm working on a couple of anthologies that I really can't, I don't like talking about. You know, one um, will be kind of weird and dark, and the other one will be horror, definitely straight horror, uh, for two different publishers. So, you do do a number of dark things, don't you, Ellen? Mostly, yeah. yeah. <laughs> of course, I'm also working on the best horror number 13. As well. Yeah. I'm busy reading, 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 reading. Yeah. I've got several um, of the novellas that I acquired and edited are coming out on tour this year and in the next year, probably. Um, Night of the Mannequins by Stephen Graham Jones will be out in September. And it's kind of a teenage slasher novella. And Kathleen Jennings' Fly Away, which is... Really yeah, gorgeous, I can't gorgeous, wait for that. Gorgeous. It's complex. It's weird and very, very dark. Um, Out of Body was published by Jeff Ford a few months, a couple of months ago. Um, uh, I just have one that I recently bought by um, Malcolm Devlin, who is also known as Vince Haig. His real name is Malcolm Devlin. You know, and he was a student of mine. It's a novella. It's, it's actually a plague novella, but not. it was written before this plague, and it's not a, this kind of plague, but it's really, really good. And I've got, oh, um, I have Cassandra Kaur's, um Nothing But Black and Teeth is coming out from Nightfire. Uh, that'll be one of their earliest publications. It'll be out in 2021. Um, and that's really very good. I hope I have, I have a couple of things coming in that were pitches, you know, that are, that I'm waiting for the writers to finish them. Oh, and I'm also uh, the editor of, uh, sorry, the, uh, 
Victor, uh, Veronica Shanus has her collection, her first collection coming out, Burning Girls. And um, Roshi Chen and I, <clears throat> Roshi actually approached me a couple of years ago. We had, you know, I had published a couple of Veronica's novellas and long novelette on tour.com before we had the tour.com novella program. <clears throat> and Roshi approached me and said, do you think Veronica would like to do a collection with us and you can edit it? I said, I don't, sure. You know, so, and, but she had to write a couple of new stories. And so it took a while, but she's written two new stories. The book's coming out, I think in March 21, if I'm, I think. And it's called Burning Girls and, and other somethings. I can't remember, I can never remember the subtitles. So that, and it's got a fantastic cover. The cover is actually um, the Babasa sisters who did the Burning Girl cover for Nabella online, which I think we've taken it offline and it'll eventually go back on. So yes, yeah, so I'm working on a bunch of stuff. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like uh, you're just kicking back and not doing no. anything. I have to start saying no. Like, <laughs> I'm hoping to buy another novella by someone I can't say because I don't know if it's going to work out. You know, yeah, I've got stuff happening. <laughs> you're amazing. <laughs> I'm exhausted thinking about it. <laughs> I was exhausted listening to it. <laughs> I wonder why I'm so tired. Oh, I know why. <laughs> yeah, because you got 800 things you're working on. It's fun to juggle. I mean, that's I don't have to work on one thing, you know, unless I have a deadline. And that's kind of, oh, and Final Cuts just came out about a month ago. That was my movie horror anthology. Um, yeah. But, you know, it's it's really... It's got, you got to love doing it or you wouldn't be doing it. Well, exactly. But I still have to start saying no, I think. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> Well, as long as I can't travel, I might as well edit, you know? I mean, usually I travel at least once a month. I was supposed to t take at least two, three international trips this year that aren't happening. Yeah. And they're being well pushed to 21 or 22, I guess, if I'm lucky. If we're lucky, yeah. Right, yeah. yeah. Well, I want to thank you guys for stopping by with us. And it's great talking to you, Ellen. It's always good to see you. And Matthew, Bye. wonderful to meet you. You too, thank you. Yeah, maybe, maybe we'll get to hang out at a bar at a convention again someday, maybe. Yeah, that would be terrific. I'd love that. Oh, yeah. can Kathy let me know where she found the um, the free backgrounds from BBC? Yeah, once we finish up, then just you guys hang around and we'll chat for a bit. Um, this is Mike Zipser here at Faster Forward saying take care and we'll be back with some more. And thank you, guys. Adios. Thank you.